Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bo Kahn, and I am the Conical Phillips Petroleum Associate Professor of Chinese and Asian Studies and the co-director of the OU Institute for US-China Issues. Welcome to the Institute's speaker series on steep issues, which promote dialogue on security, technology, economic, environmental, public health, and political issues in US-China relations. Before introducing today's speaker, please allow me to thank my colleagues, uh, Stephanie Sager and Maura McAndrew for providing the logistical assistance that has made this event possible. Every five years, China has a nationwide leadership turnover. This turnover carries enormous implications. It ushers in a new cohort of leaders that will forge the vision, set the priorities, and determine the direction for the country for the next five to 10 years. As China globalizes its economy through trade, investment, the Going Out campaign, and the Belt Road Initiative, and expands its participation in, the, in global governance, the type of leaders China selects also carries enormous implications for the rest of the world. Under the leadership of the, CIS, the Chinese Communist Party, China will convene its 20th party congress this fall. Although there's little doubt that President Xi will hold on to his positions in the party, government, and the military, and begin his third term, the 20th Party Congress will, will produce a new Central Committee, Polity Bureau, and Politburo Standing Committee, who will make up the top echelon of Chinese leadership. What are the characteristics and, and of this co new cohort of Chinese leaders? What do their backgrounds and outlooks portend for the way China will handle the domestic and external challenges that, li that, lay in that lay in store for the country? What will this round of leadership change tell us about the future process of leadership transition in China? And finally, what are the implications of the leadership transition for US-China relations? These are questions of great consequence for both China and the rest of the world. I cannot think of anyone that's better prepared to help us answer the, the above mentioned questions than our speaker today. Widely recognized as the leading light on the transformation of political leaders, generation change, and the Chinese middle class, Dr. Chen Li is the director of the John L. Thornton China Center, a senior fellow in the foreign, foreign policy program at Brookings, and the principal editor of the Thornton Center Chinese Thinker series published by the Brookings Institution Press. He's also a director of the National Committee on US-China Relations. Raised in Shanghai during the Cultural Revolution, Dr. Li came to the United States in 1985 and earned a master's degree in Asian studies from the University of California, Berkeley, and a doctorate degree in political science from Princeton University. Dr. Li is a prolific writer. He's published numerous articles and is the author or editor of over a dozen books. His latest book is entitled Middle Class Shanghai, Reshaping US-China Engagement, published by the Brookings Institution Press in 2021. He's currently completing a book manuscript with the working title, Xi Jinping's Prodigies, Rising Elite Groups in the Chinese Leadership. Without further ado, let me turn the podium to Dr. Li. Dr. Li, the podium is uh, yours. Thank you. Thanks, Professor uh, Kong, for both your kind invitation and your overly generous introduction. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to exchange views and ideas with you and with your distinguished audience. I also want to applaud the University of Oklahoma Institute for US-China issues for both your innovative research on key issues, as you said, the steep security, technology, economics, environment, public health, and the politics, all of which are enormously important in today's world. But also for your long-standing endeavor for, uh, to promote cultural and educational exchanges across the Pacific. My presentation will focus on politics, more specifically, China's elite politics and the political environment in which Chinese leadership confronts both domestically and internationally. Now, the year 2022 will be a very important one 
for China because the Chinese Communist Party will host its 20th National Congress, as uh, uh, Professor Kong said, uh, once every five year event, uh, uh, sometime this fall. China's Party Congress has often been um, an occasion uh, in large scale change uh, in the Chinese, uh, uh, in the country's national leadership, and also for embarking on a new trajectory in the country's, in the country's uh, uh, domestic and foreign policy. Now, intense jockeying for power among political um, uh, elites on the eve of the party congress is also common. So is the top leadership a strong need for uh, leadership unity and the social political stability. Now in the next 40 minutes, I will discuss three issues as the slides show. Uh, first, peakingology, importance as a methodology. Now peakingology is a term referring to the study of Chinese elite politics, especially what is happening in Beijing's Zhongnanhai, the headquarter in the CCP leadership. Now, let me begin by very briefly mentioning the importance of the Pekingology, which unfortunately, in my view, uh, is on the decline in the United States. Very few analysts in the US spend uh, much needed time and uh, energy to systematically study this crucial subject. Now, to, uh, the topic is very, very important. As we know that the nature of the Chinese political system, as the Chinese uh, themselves acknowledge, is a CCP monopoly of party, or what foreign analysts say that the Leninist party state. This is in theory and in, also in constitution, both party and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the state. CCP is entitled to control over the army, personnel, which means the uh, leadership appointment, media, the legal system, also the use according to the Chinese Communist Party uh, constitution. Now, to a great extent, the elite you know, politics in Zhongnanhai or in Beijing is the only game in the town. Xi Jinping also recently said, I quote, the key to the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation lies in the party. Uh, in his uh, uh, recent speeches, he talked about the importance of the small number of the key officials in Chinese, or in his term, it's called Guan Jian Sao Su. Now, to uh, state the obvious, the CCP elite politics, its composition and the cohesion have profound implications for the United States, especially uh, now that China has immense amass more influence on the global economy and regional security than at any other point in modern history. Now let me start with the structure uh, because some of the, uh, you may not be very familiar with the political uh, the organization structure of China. So let me very quickly mention some of them. Now this is the once every five year National Party Congress. The Party Congress um, is only held once after the County Congress the older delegates will uh, no longer work and they will not uh, uh, meet again until five years later by different group of people. Now in, the, in that party Congress, um, they will elect or select two uh, important uh, committees or commission. One is the central committee. Um, uh, the other is the central commission for disciplinary inspection, which is the anti-corruption uh, monitoring body which is less important uh, compared with the Central Committee. Now, the Central Committee also will directly uh, 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 affirm or reaffirm the Central Military Commission, or in their term, elect, but in reality is, of course, already decided uh, uh, a few months or, or a few weeks before the Party Congress. Now, the Central Committee also need to uh, choose the General Secretary, Power Bureau Standing Committee and the Power Bureau. And the Power Bureau Standing Committee and Power Bureau will also appoint the people, not so many, seven, sometimes uh, um, uh, uh, eight or nine uh, members of secretary, which is like the 
general office of the, of the White House or chief of staff of the White House, but this is the, the important body to handle daily routines uh, in terms of paperwork, paper flow, and uh, also meetings and some of our preparations. So, so this is structure. Now, as for now, the Communist Party, uh, about a few months ago, uh, they announced that the total number is 95 million. It's a really uh, quite, uh, quite a, a large party. As we know that it's more than the entire population of Germany, which is 80 some uh, million. Uh, so 95 million of the uh, Communist Party member. Now they will uh, select through all the uh, local elections and then eventually form 38 delegations. Uh, these delegation will have 2,300 delegates to attend the National Party Congress. Now towards the end, maybe there are some people will be jobbed, disqualified, or for some reasons, uh, no longer participate. But uh, this number, 2,300, was also the number you know, for the last party Congress five years ago. But eventually last party Congress, there's 20 people did not make it. So it's about 2,280. So we probably expect the same number, similar number. Now the delegates uh, will um, elect through votes, um, the four members and also alternate, uh, 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 alternates. Of course, that the, the, the election is a little bit limited. For example, they wanted to have the two, 104 members, they may give 20 more uh, or, or, you know, uh, those who are uh, uh, the, the bottom will be eliminated. It's the same things with the alternate, but it's a limited election. But there's no election for the power bureau because it's already put these people on the ballots. There's no, not multi-candidates election. They will choose 25 power bureau members. This is very, very important leadership body. Of course, central committee is also important. It includes governors, provincial party secretaries, ministers, top military officers, and the top um, uh, executives of the leading companies, uh, some of the top university president or party secretaries, and the functional uh, elites in the party and in the government, and etc. So if we want to have a political career in the future, you do need to belong to that important body, Central Committee. But of course, Power Bureau is even more important. Um, this is 25 people. Among the 25 people, the most important is the Power Bureau Standing Committee. Um, you know, uh, uh, they also part of the 25 people. This is superior to the power making body. Then on the top, the very top is General Secretary. Uh, right now is Xi Jinping. Now, uh, for outside the world, uh, especially in the West, we have a lot of you know, um, kind of notions. Some are valid, some are the subject of debate. The conventional perception of the Chinese leadership, especially those uh, commonly held in the West, uh, you know, I listed some such as you know, rigid, opaque, stagnant, ineffective, unpopular, winners take all, all have some truths in my view. But it is also important to for analysts of Chinese of, of analysts of China to recognize that some or even all of this conventional wisdom should be subject to more critical, more balanced, and a more objective analysis. Otherwise, foreign analysts will have difficulties to interpret some facts and the trends, and will likely derive misleading assessments. I will say that um, our you know, uh, assessment or prediction of China you know, made a lot of serious mistakes over the past few decades. Sometimes over underestimated, sometimes overestimated. Uh, so these are all do not serve the, you know, uh, the, the need for accurate understanding of what's going on in Zhongnanhai, what's going on in the Chinese leadership. Now stagnant, for example, uh, to a certain extent, it's true in terms of the one party rule and the Leninist party state I described early on. It's always like that. So in that regard, it is stagnant, but it does not tell the rapid turnover of the political elites. Now, let me share you with some slides. This is the last party Congress, the most important leadership bodies, um, including Central Committee, uh, Central, Milit uh, Central Disciplinary Inspection Commission, Secretary, Power Bureau, Power Bureau Standing Committee, 
and the Central Military Commission. These are all very, very important leadership body. The yellow color are new members. The blue color are remaining members. I mean, look at that. In the, in the Central Committee, 75% are new members. The Disciplinary Commission, it's 93%. All seven members of Secretary are new. And uh, um, Power Bureau, among these 25 people, 15, 16% are new. The seven most powerful figures, five out of seven are first timers. Now the military commission, seven people, three are new. Now this could be misleading, but actually in my analysis, my data source show the military actually has the fast, fastest and or, or greatest turnover. You look at these, the military members altogether 66 among these uh, 376 um, Central Committee members, including both full member and alternate members. The all alternate members, 100% are first timers. And then 85% are uh, the new members. This is certainly also included those, uh, we consider that those promoted from alternate for full member also new. If we delete that, we'll be a little bit less. So it's remarkable, 91% of the military elites uh, in the Central Committee are new or newly promoted. Now, this is actually not entirely new. If you look at the, the Central Committee, the composition um, since 1982, um, roughly it's a 62, on average it's 62%. And the last party Congress uh, is about 75%, as I mentioned earlier. Now, uh, let me also mention that these numbers consider those who were promoted from alternate to four members as new members too. So if we consider them as the returning members, there will be 10 to 15% uh, uh, fewer. So still significant, more than 50% or, uh, or, or, or even higher. Uh, so that probably explain, uh, that's what explains that the entire the, the term of the stagnant I used early is subject to some debate. The structure is stagnant, but the internal dynamics, the change of leadership is very, very rapid. Now also I forecast, for the next party Congress, I mean, in, in, uh, which will be held um, uh, later this year, will be about uh, will be less than last time, but uh, roughly is a uh, you know sixty five percent or or more, a uh, little bit more. So that's the that's the the the, the turnover rate. Now, how do I do this? Um, I think let me very quickly mention about the methodology. This is actually uh, detailedly uh, mentioned discussed in my uh, book published uh, you know, a few years ago by Brookings Press called uh, Xi Jinping, uh, Chinese Politics in the Xi Jinping Era, uh, Re Reassessing Collective Leadership. It's a 500 pages long with uh, 84 charts in the table with 800 footnotes and then including 200 Chinese terminologies. And finally, it is an index. It's the 600 Chinese leaders. Uh, 500 of them are still uh, working and 100 already retired or uh, purge or die and etc. So, but the 500 are still very much uh, still working, although among them probably half uh, will make to the next party Congress uh, or still play important role. Right. Now, uh, so uh, this is actually based on the database I established when I was a graduate student at the UC Berkeley in 1987 under the supervision of Barbara Scalapino, uh, a professor at the Berkeley. And uh, uh, by now, there's uh, about uh, uh, nearly 30,000 elites information. Each of them has uh, somewhere 90 uh, entries or to, between 90 to 100 entries, although not, uh, not complete, some are missing, but uh, uh, the, the categories uh, to try to input the data is about, uh, uh, about the 90, 90 uh, regular entries or inputs. Now, this includes all members and alternate members of the Central Committee and the since 13th Party Congress in 1987, also including some of the people who uh, were considered as candidates but did not make it, and also vice governors, vice provincial uh, party secretaries, vice ministers, and et cetera. So that's the database which I make all these uh, predictions and these analysis. Now, also, I want to, uh, so again, for more information, you can get the, uh, the definitions or categories or methodologies and 
easier the sources, you should uh, check that book. But also that I'm writing a series uh, I started about a few weeks ago. Uh, it's a, published by a journal, uh, online journal called China and the US Focus. So it's, a, it's a called a reshuffling report. Uh, this is the first uh, piece. So far published three pieces. The altogether will be probably 25 to 30 pieces when uh, by the time that the party Congress finish. So try to analyze various factors and uh, largely empirical research and anticipating and analyze leadership changes in that party Congress. So this is also source. If you are interested in that subject, uh, you know, please check the sources. Now, let me move to uh, the second topic, uh, which both is a, a forecast. This is a very important part of the Pekingology. The, I predict that this will be large scale leadership turnover. Now, let me go back to uh, the, uh, the institutional norm and the rules which adopted uh, in the post Deng era, largely under the leadership of uh, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, and also actually also apply to the 19th century committee five years ago under Xi Jinping's leadership. Now, these are the four, there are more, um, these kind of four, uh, norms and rules. But uh, I wanted to uh, mention four, the most important one. When is the age limit, for example, in the last party Congress, those born before 1950s were disqualified from membership on the 19th um, you know, the century, century committee. Now, the same age limit were also used in the 17th party Congress. The cut year was 1940, and the, the 18th party Congress is 1945. And uh, so if that's the case for the upcoming 20th party country, it is supposed to, to be 1955, the year. But of course, this will not uh, be strictly reinforced. Uh, there will be some exceptions uh, this time, given that Xi Jinping himself was born in 1953. As uh, uh, Professor Kong said, that we expect that Xi Jinping will start his third year. And also the, uh, not only exception for himself in terms of the age requirement, but also will apply for a few other. Will not be too many, uh, probably you know, five or six or seven. This kind of number out of 376 um, uh, 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 Central Committee members. So previously, anyone who was born 1955 should uh, supposed to uh, retire. If you're not in the Central Committee, you could not be Power Bureau or Power Bureau Standing Committee. But I think there will be some exceptions. But of course, uh, this is a uh, um, uh, the, the things that are already in the Chinese official narrative. The other is term limits. Uh, no more than two five-year terms in the same position and uh, three five-year terms in the same level of leadership. Now, this is a, there's a, some ambiguities about the party um, a power bill standing committee. Certainly, there's no restriction on the general secretary in terms of term limits, but the, the, the things is power bill standing committee could be considered as the same level of leadership but uh, previously also se uh, seriously uh, strictly reinforced. But this time, uh, since Xi Jinping will uh, start his third term, and also there will be perhaps some other exceptions, uh, not too many, again, that uh, will not be strictly reinforced. The other is a regional or bureaucratic representation. For example, each province has two full membership seats. Now, after party Congress, they can quickly change, reshuffle, but during, and before the party Congress a few months, you can see that the each, uh, each province, they yeah, will have two. Now for minority regions like uh, uh, Tibet and Xinjiang, they can have three, sometimes even four. Uh, otherwise in the older provinces, the general secretary, I mean, the, uh, the provincial party secretary or governor or in major cities like Shanghai, Beijing, Tianjin, and um, Chongqing will be the mayors. So each province level will have two seats. The military I mentioned, there's a 66 people, including 41 full members, 25 alternate. Now, this is the same last party Congress, last two party Congress. I assume this will continue this kind of distribution. And also there's a more candidate than seats election I mentioned early on. And uh, you have a 204 full members. You put the 222 people as a candidate, 8% eliminated for the alternate, same things. And uh, certainly some of the people on the ballot, uh, but they're eventually eliminated because of this election, including Minister of Water Resources, Chen Lei, President of the CAS, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, Wang Wei Wang, and the 
powerful commander of the Northern Theater uh, Command, and uh, Song Puxian. Uh, so these are the examples. Sometimes we may not have the full list, and uh, those who are eliminated, but usually are uh, uh, leaked to the public. Now, also the age is, uh, this is tells us that uh, the last party Congress strictly reinforced. No one was born before 1949 uh, uh, or in 1949. So anyone who was born after 1950, including 1950, uh, is qualified. That explained Wang Qishan could not be the Central Committee. So if you are not in the Central Committee, you cannot be part of the Bureau of Power Standing Committee. So he ended up with uh, the Vice President of PRC ranked in the number eight. So uh, because the Vice President uh, does not have the age requirement or term limits, even could be a non-party member, you know, uh, as happened before. Now, Xi Jinping, uh, during his tenure of the two terms over the past 10 years, he profoundly changed uh, Chinese uh, uh, political, uh, you know, uh, landscape. Um, uh, uh, in addition to very tight control uh, over media and uh, also uh, in terms of Xinjiang and et cetera, although his predecessor did the similar things. He also transformed some of the, changed some of the norms, but the most remarkable is the list. Uh, when he started a big, bold and broad anti-corruption campaign and um, purchased a 200, 440 vice provincial minister army level uh, uh, leaders or above, uh, including about 80 major generals or above. And also in the 18th uh, Central Committee, like 43 people you know, uh, or 40, 44 uh, uh, purged, uh, purged means arrested. And uh, relative speaking, the 19th Central Committee is less and the two, form, two members um, purged formally. And then these, recently they added one more person, so three. The third person, although it's not uh, not the trial yet. So basically just three people. So relatively speaking, this time it's less, but uh, early on again, um, uh, uh, 10 years ago, uh, really very drastic uh, change. Now also he started large scale military reform including three components, uh, change from the Russian model emphasized on um, army to a joint venture, the American model by air force joint operation by Navy and et cetera. And also con uh, directly control uh, uh, you know, the, the four, five services and the operation theaters rather than through the uh, kind of four departments. So, so he, he really marginalized the role of the four military departments, making them far less important. And finally, as we discussed earlier, promoting young guards, uh, those people very quickly promoted the uh, military leadership. Now also cohesive campaign against Taiwan, people are very familiar. Strong poverty elimination campaign is very, very remarkable. He did not start it, but he really uh, enhanced, uh, increased the budget significantly. And also call for common prosperity and uh, uh, launch some new initiative to, to re reduce economic disparity. And that also the COVID things, that the Jacunia measures to control uh, COVID-19 spread in the country. In the country. There's some criticism uh, in and out of China, but the, on the other hand, to a certain extent, it's also uh, effective, uh, at, at least up till now, and uh, 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 less deaths, less affection, and et cetera. And also, he started the Green Development Campaign, which actually uh, is quite significant if we compare some of the numbers. Um, uh, uh, for example, that um, uh, in 2008, that uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, um, uh, concern about corruption uh, uh, according to uh, uh, um, the econ, econ, uh, econ watch that actually Kongbo, uh, Professor Kongbo is an expert in this area that uh, the, the out of 20 most polluted cities uh, in, the, in the world in 2008, 16 of them located in China because of air pollutions and et cetera. But uh, 10 years later in 2018, according to the same um, uh, research institute, Econ watch, 15 were in India only two were in China. So Xi Jinping certainly claimed that uh, under his watch over the past uh, uh, 10 years or, or less, that uh, there's tremendous progress in environment protection. Of course, China still faces some serious pollution in environment degradation, but improve in a significant way. And finally, it's a new uh, proactive foreign policy, including Build a Road Initiative and the AIIB, uh, and also try to establish global partnership network 
especially in uh, South America, in Africa, in the Middle East, and etc. Now, so these are the, the change. Now, let me show a few things. One is the anti-corruption. You look at the, the this include uh, uh, Zhou Yongkang, the Power Bureau Standing Committee member, one of the seven was purged. He was also in charge of the security uh, 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 and police. Then the four, four top military officers also purged. And uh, 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 two of them are now in jail for life. One already died because of uh, uh, of um, you know uh, uh, personal health problem, the last one Zhang Yang committed suicide. So again, these are the highest, the highest ranking officers or purged. You can see how bold, how decisive Xi Jinping's anti-corruption campaign. Now this is the poverty elimination that the Xi Jinping launched. Now again, as I mentioned, it started from Deng Xiaoping, and uh, uh, but the look at the, from nineteen, um, I'm sorry, from twenty twelve, the budget increased. Drastically, this is the year Xi Jinping became top leader. So, so he got a lot of credit by uh, not only just poverty reduction, but in the Chinese term, the precision poverty elimination uh, with uh, that kind of effort. Now, Xi Jinping presented himself as a man of the leader of the people, uh, distant uh, himself from the princeling, of uh, the leaders from the prominent family background. And uh, his populism and his call for common prosperity actually started day one when he became top leader. Now certainly become the national policy or development strategy in the country. Now, also that some of the rules I mentioned and the norm ended or changed during the Xi Jinping era, especially during the past few years in his uh, second term. And when is the abolishment of the presidential term limits and uh, this will allow him to stay in power for more than three terms. And also that uh, previously we strict, strictly reinforced mandatory retirement age is no longer uh, uh, will be re, uh, strictly reinforced. Uh, so at least there will be some exception. And the factional balance previously, there's a two like a coalition competing or balance each other by Zhang Zemin's uh, group and by Hu Jintao's group. Uh, in the Power Bureau and, uh, Standing Committee and Power Bureau, largely balanced or equally distributed, but not anymore. Uh, Xi Jinping's people certainly has the majority. And also under Xi, Deng Xiaoping, there's some kind of succession norm. You will identify a, a, a possible successor after the next leader. So this is called a grandpa kind of uh, designated successor, uh, although never formally announced like uh, Deng Xiaoping not only decided uh, uh, Zhang Zemin, but also decided uh, Zhang Zemin's successor, Hu Jintao. So if that's the case that, uh, that uh, you know, uh, Hu Jintao, uh, 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 you know, not only decide, not only let Xi Jinping to succeed him, but also uh, want to designate little Hu, Hu Chenghua, that was the previous model, but uh, certainly no longer valid. Usually you should put that person to practice in the power standing committee, for at least five, maybe even 10 years, but it did not happen in the last party Congress. So of course, Xi Jinping uh, so far has no identified successor. And also that the change the role of general secretary previously as uh, the general secretary and the, uh, in the post uh, Deng era, especially under Zhang Zemin, especially under Hu Jintao, they called first among equals, but Xi Jinping certainly is above the uh, first among e equal. Uh, and uh, these other colleagues in the Power Bureau Standing Committee need to give a debriefing report, Su Zi. And uh, just a few days ago, they had the annual Su Zi, but also Xi Jinping will give the personalized comments. So relationships start to change. So in a way, it's a consolidated power to try to reduce the fragmentation or infighting in the top leadership. But of course, that uh, some people think that's a good move. Some people think that uh, 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 that's uh, away from the institutionalization, move away from institutionalization. Different people have different assessment. Now, let me predict or uh, forecast um, the leadership things. Um, there's some we can expect, some uh, unclear for now. Uh, it's for sure Xi Jinping will have his third term and will further consolidate his power. And also turnover rate, as I mentioned, will be still be very high two thirds, but the lower than the last party 
the previous central committee, which was a uh, uh, you know seventy five percent, will not be that high uh, for the reason that the, the anti corruption campaign will not be that scale. And also, um, you know, uh, uh, I will give you the detail the current status to support that uh, uh, prediction. And also, the first timers will likely constitute half of the new power bureau. And uh, among them, several uh, 6G, sixth generation leaders, those who were born 1960s or maybe born 1959, it's very close, will enter the Power Bureau Standing Committee. Uh, there could be four and there could be even five. Uh, of course, the Power Bureau Standing Committee could be seven members, could also be nine members. So I will predict that the, somewhere between four to five. So this, is, this is also significant. It's uh, more than half. Uh, you know, uh, the members will be new. And also a few exceptions for age will likely be made for both retirement and the reappointment. For example, if you, you were born after 1955, so you're supposed to stay on, but the, for some reason that you need to bake into your seats. But those who were born before 1955 um, will uh, stay on to continue to uh, serve in the Power Bureau or Power Bureau Standing Committee. Now, so this is the things that already um, uh, uh, discuss or you know, kind of uh, praise in the Chinese official narrative. So we will see that uh, will be the case. Now, some things that we do not know. One is uh, we do not know whether Xi Jinping will designate a successor. I cannot say for sure, but uh, you know, ninety-five percent will be unlikely. But it's not one hundred percent. So let's see. Um, I think that he will wait at least for another five-year term to identify possible successor. This is my view, but it could be wrong. And uh, who will be in and out on the Power Bureau Standing Committee become tricky because their ages are so similar. Previously, you have the age rule and create a kind of consistency or fairness, but now it's uh, very difficult to follow that, especially that uh, you want to promote the younger leaders. And who will be the next premier? It's also an issue. Now, Li Keqiang, in terms of age, he's still qualified to stay on in the Parliament Standing Committee, but he could not be the third term premier because premier still has term limits. Now, so they will, uh, we will see you know, uh, later this uh, 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 year, and actually will be really uh, appointed by National People's Congress next March. Uh, next March, that will be a new premier. But by that, by the October, we will know who will be. Uh, that the new premier. And who will be the next PRC vice president? And um, I believe that the Wang Jisan will uh, retire because of age. And who will constitute the top team for financial, economic, foreign affairs, and the military? I will uh, mention in, in few, uh, a few couple of minutes that uh, most of these top leaders um, are actually up to the age. So we do not know uh, who will get the exception. And if not, and uh, who will be uh, their successors it will be very, very interesting. Now, early on mentioned about the two thirds, my prediction, two thirds of the Central Committee members will be new, including new promoted from alternate to four members. Now this table uh, tell us uh, the red color, you know, 51% of them already retire or move to the ceremonial positions. So they will not return to the next, next uh, central committee. And uh, four people die and the three people uh, purge. So altogether it's 53%, but of course there will be more. And uh, you know, this could change any, any, uh, in a, a, any week, you know, in a coming week. So uh, this is where the two thirds coming from. Uh, you look at this data, this is uh, uh, 376 people. Now you can uh, uh, predict with some kind of confidence that uh, two thirds of them will be new. Now, the importance is about the, the top uh, leaders for the, these three very, very important team, economic finance, foreign affairs, and military affairs. And uh, again, uh, Premier Li, uh, he could not have a third term uh, uh, for Premier. Uh, he may or may not stay in the Power of Standing Committee. So, so, which means that, um, you know, uh, and also two other top financial uh, economic technocrats, uh, Han Zhen and uh, Liu He, famous Liu He, um, you know, uh, uh, we do not know whether um, 
some of them will stay on. I, my view is that uh, one or two in that whole entire list, you know, about uh, eight people probably will stay on. Uh, Xi Jinping has good reason uh, to emphasize continuity of economic policies or importance of foreign affairs to let uh, people like Wang Yi or Han Zhen to stay on or Liu He, uh, but not all of them, but uh, one or two of them. All the three military uh, top leader, I think they will retire. And uh, we already see some of the line up. And uh, so that's the uh, major change. Now the premier, I will say there's uh, four candidates, including two uh, in terms of age, they probably uh, will retire, but uh, Xi Jinping will use the exception to let one of them to stay on. But of course we do not know, maybe just to follow the age things. That if that's the case, the, the premier will most likely will be Li Qiang, current Shanghai party secretary, or Hu Chenghua, who does not belong to Xi Jinping's faction. He is a protege of uh, Hu, uh, Hu, Jin, Hu Jintao, currently vice premier. He could also be a candidate. So if you want me to predict, I think probably Han Zheng and Li Qiang is more likely, one of them is more likely, but I cannot say, say for sure. Could also be complete the dark horse. We do not know, but uh, I think these four candidates are pretty solid. Now, let me move to the last point. Uh, Implications. Uh, is that okay, Kongbo, uh, my time? It's okay? Yeah, I probably need uh, five yeah, to 10 fine. minutes. Yes. Okay. okay, good. Now, I well, for that section, I just want to show you some examples, some rising stars to show um, what kind of people, as uh, Professor Kong mentioned, because uh, elites, their background, um, their you know, uh, uh, occupational identities, political affiliations, and et cetera, all, all important information. So I want to show some of the leading candidates for Power Bureau and also for use them as an example for the kind of new groups start to emerge. One person is Zhejiang Party Secretary and um, born in the 1960s, studied um, you know, uh, uh, in the aerospace industry, top schools in China, and also uh, served as a visiting scholar at the Germany. He speaks, um, very good English. And uh, someone even said like native like uh, my friends in the aerospace, like Boeing told me that, uh, uh, that I, I also met him briefly, but never talked with him in English. But a lot of friends in Boeing and the US business leaders, they're impressed by his English. And uh, he advanced his career from aerospace industry. And uh, he really served as the uh, 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 commander in Shenzhou, uh, a, a, a spacecraft system, and also chief commander of uh, spacecraft and uh, China's main space engineering. This is really very serious of science. And also deputy commander of China's lunar exploration project, you know, phase two to moon. And uh, so again, he is a real technocrat. And also later on, he moved to um, the, uh, the aerospace um, industry uh, served as a president and uh, as the fifth academy of China Aerospace and, uh, uh, and the Corporation, deputy general uh, 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 manager of that gigantic firm, but then moved to local government. So briefly as the vice governor of Ningxia, then executive vice governor of Zhejiang, and, right, uh, and then before becoming party secretary, he was the number two person as the governor of Zhejiang. And uh, he currently is party secretary of Zhejiang. So this is a uh, uh, show you as people from aerospace, uh, uh, not only like him, but there are several others, including like Ma Xinri, just appointed as Xinjiang party chief. Uh, it's similar background and uh, 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 top notch, um, you know, executive or technocrat in the aerospace industry. The other one is a uh, uh, Beijing mayor. And in the energy sector, in the environment protection, I, I think that the Kung Po probably know, know him. Um, he studied at Tsinghua, but got his PhD from London, from the Imperial College. And he spent altogether 10 years in London. And um, of course, no comment about his English. Of course, very good, right? And, uh, uh, but after 10 years uh, study and work, he returned to China, advanced his career from Tsinghua University and um, as department chair and vice president, president, and then serve as the uh, Minister of Environmental Protection. Uh, he's currently mayor of Beijing in the uh, you know, closing ceremony, you see that he 
um, pass the, the, the flag of Olympics to uh, mayors of Italy. Right? So that's uh, 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 Chen Jinying. Um, he will be a candidate for the Power Bureau. Now, at the time that China emphasizes the alternative, alternative energy, uh, carbon neutrality, he will be a perfect person uh, to be a counterpart as, uh, you know, to, to discuss about the climate change and, um, and et cetera. So he is uh, uh, already important position, highly likely will be getting further promotion. Another person is Fu Jian Party Secretary, also born 1960s. Study medicine is a medical doctor by training. And he was a visiting scholar at Harvard University, not in the Kennedy School, but in the public health school, but also studied, um, got his PhD from Russia. Not so many Chinese elites got their degree from Russia, but he's one of them. I think in the near future, we will see more people um, study Russia probably start to emerge in Chinese leadership. But relatively speaking, compared with those Western trend, it is still a small number, but he is an exception. And um, uh, he also a top-notch medical expert and uh, served as vice chairman of the executive committee of WHO for two years. And uh, he largely also represents the work in the think tank, in particular in the public health with the state council and et cetera, and have the solid experience in public health uh, 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 bureaucracy, and also served the director of the state food and drug administration for two years. And uh, uh, before he became party secretary of Fujian, he was a governor of Sichuan, so again, uh, at the time that the public health and uh, uh, becoming important, he is well positioned and also a candidate for the next power bureau, if not next time, but also probably the, the term uh, after. But of course, I don't want to give the impression that the Chinese leaders all like the three people I mentioned, well-educated, the technocrats, the cosmopolitan view, good ex uh, leadership experience. There's some different kind of people Xi Jinping also want to promote. Uh, most noticeably, the Ulumochi party secretary, he came from a completely different background, did not go to a top elite school, but went to the party school of Xinjiang and uh, served as local government, also was a soldier and the POA uh, for uh, four or five years, and advanced career step by step from a local administration and uh, uh, gradually moved to important position. Uh, Chinese media now actually um, uh, really uh, try to promote him, particularly his tough line over Xinjiang. And uh, he is currently the uh, party secretary of Ulumuchi. He will enter the, uh, uh, the Central Committee uh, for first time, his first time, probably not in the Power Bureau, but someone similar to him may also have a chance to move to the Power Bureau. But it's just a good example to see different kinds of leaders, although probably small number, uh, but Xi Jinping also want to promote. So it's a good balance will be very interesting here to see that the balance. And uh, now in terms of economic policy, I do not, because time constraint, I do not want to do uh, too much detail. Just want to mention there's a new different development model, uh, 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 so-called the third special economic zone, which is known the, the first two is the Shenzhen and Shanghai's Pudong, but this will be different development model. It's not by market driven, uh, by uh, export uh, foreign investment, but rather by domestic demand, by innovation and by community housing, not by property development, and the more sustainable and uh, supposed to be more innovative, more green development, but tremendous resources already input. The concern is whether this is driven by market or by planning and et cetera. But this will be different model. It was having emphasis on uh, community development and common prosperity and et cetera. Now into foreign policy, I, I think that we will see that the Xi Jinping the new teams, a lot of them are, are really uh, top-notch scientists and uh, technocrats, and the, they will help to accelerate the technological and the indigenous innovation to compete with the US, to promote the state control of strategic industries or sectors uh, in the wake of the deterioration of the relations and uh, with the United States, and also particularly uh, the containment from the US-led coalition against China, and also expand the domestic market over foreign market with emphasis on the further development of China's uh, uh, cluster cities and uh, clusters of job, uh, super cities. And to maintain domestic and social political stability with great support for less privileged social economic groups in the name of common prosperity and uh, Xi Jinping's new development model. And also propagate both Chinese meritocracy and the leadership of unity 
on the eve of the 20th Party Congress and beyond, especially targeting China's neighboring countries and the countries in Africa and South America uh, with China's own development model. And finally, to enhance China's influence and leverage in the rapidly changing international environment, especially in the wake of you know, uh, 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 Russia's invasion of the Ukraine. And uh, also early on, in terms of the uh, Russia's interference on Kazakhstan. Now, uh, to end, I also wanted to go back to Shanghai, and uh, because some of the leaders advanced their career from coastal region, including Guangdong, Zhejiang, Fujian, Zhejiang, and Shanghai. Now, as this area is actually interesting enough, it's for market reform, for foreign investment, for cosmopolitanism. And uh, I will pred I predict that uh, the, the next party Congress, actually there will be more uh, leaders have Shanghai experience, uh, either born in Shanghai or advance their career in Shanghai, spend significant time in Shanghai. Of course, with exception, Xi Jinping only spent eight months in Shanghai as the Shanghai party chief, but he really promoted a lot of people from Shanghai to important position or appoint his own people to serve as Shanghai leaders for many years. And, uh, so I will say that uh, depends on whether seven or nine, that uh, will be like a 57%, um, you know, uh, power bill standing committee members. These are the most powerful superior leadership body from Shanghai. Now for more information, you can look at my Shanghai book. It's already published. There's one chapter about Shanghai leaders and they really have different characteristics. Um, they are contacted with the West and they are market driven and they are pragmatism, but also the other book, is Xi Jinping's protege that we're supposed to be published this summer or the fall about the new elite group. Thank you very much. Over. Professor Kong. Kong? Yes, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Li, for such a rich and thorough discussion. Uh, somehow I can't start my video. I don't know what's going on with, uh, with Zoom. Uh, Stephanie, do you happen to know why I can't start my my video? Uh, if if Maybe if we can, can yeah, if we can start that, that's okay. Uh, no worries. Yeah. Oh, oh, thank good, you. Good. All right. Good. Well, thank thank you so much for such a, a rich and thorough discussion. Just uh, following up on what you said at the at the um, end, uh, with respect to the implications for U.S. China relations. I wonder if it's correct to say that um, uh, in the era of great power rivalry, uh, based on the backgrounds you've just shared with us, uh, uh, China will remain uh, open to the world and, and its integration into the global economy probably will continue to grow. However, um, the US may not, may not be the most important priority for China. Is that, is that correct? Well, this is a, a very good comment. Um, I think um, I actually um, largely agree with you on your assessment. This is also my view, but I wanted to have some qualification. First of all, yes, China wants to be integrated with outside world. For China, economic ruralization is a not a choice, but a necessity. Mm -hmm. um, China benefited more, probably I would argue more than any other country Yes. Um, in terms of all income group benefit. In the United States, probably is only 20% of rich people benefit. So that's True. when American middle class is shrinking, right? And there's a, a strong criticism. But in China, of course, there's some concern, but by and large, even poor people got a little poverty. Middle class did not exist uh, you know, 40 years ago, but become a very important part of Chinese uh, society. They all benefited. And of course, not to mention about the elites. So for them, and also China lack of natural resources, you know, you know, uh, uh, so well. And so it's not a, 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 a choice, but a necessity. Mm -hmm. That's explained the Build the Road Initiative and many other things. And, uh, uh, but they worry about the US led containment against China um, the, started early on by uh, President Trump, the trade war, that all kind of comprehensive decoupling decoupling also included in the educational uh, arena. Mm -hmm. So you need to be um, 
from Chinese leadership perspective, uh, it's not, uh, um, you know, they don't want, but they do need to prepare the worst scenario, like the couple in the bad supply chains and the, and the trade war uh, escalate and et cetera. Uh, so in that regard, uh, they put more emphasis on domestic development, from domestic urban development, and uh, uh, particularly in the areas of the Bay areas in Guangdong and the lower Yangtze River in Shanghai and the uh, Chongqing Chengdu Corridor and the, the, the Xiong'an I just mentioned about the, the Beijing, Hebei and Tianjin Corridor, et cetera. Now, actually um, China for most of the reform era, they put the United States as the emphasis of emphasis yeah. uh, using the word of Chinese leaders, so zhong zhong zhi zhong. Right. It's the emphasis on emphasis, but not anymore. It's not because China does not want, but rather you face a country that does not want to, uh, to cooperate with you from their perspective. So you're forced to uh, try to put your emphasis on China's neighboring country and to EU, despite the EU countries also have serious concern about China, but the Chinese think that the EU's position and the US are not the, yeah, identical. Uh, maybe ideologic, ideologically, uh, they are more critical of China in terms of values they signed with the United States, but they, they do have different views about so-called Cold War with China. Mm -hmm. All right. uh, that's explained that Biden actually uh, also spoke in the United Nations saying that we are not going to fight a Cold War with China, although to a certain extent that it already looked like a Cold War against China. This is largely because China's neighboring country um, including South Korea, to a certain extent, including Japan, does not want to necessarily go back to Cold War with China. Certain European countries, European leaders, including a British leader, said that, uh, again, we do not want to the, the go back to the Cold War with China. We have serious concern about China, but uh, they wanted to continue to engage with China, especially like uh, Germany, you, you know, for five years, consecutive years, China is the largest trading partner. Yeah. And, uh, so that's explained um, that the China uh, will put uh, there's some strategic shift. Now, not to mention about uh, for China, they think we are forced to form much tight, tighter relation with Iran, with uh, Russia. Yeah. And uh, now, I mean, with uh, such a strong military bloc led by United States and NATO, so that explains Chinese mind. I'm not saying that uh, this is uh, valid, this is uh, wise. And the reality is, as you know, that uh, Chinese elites, look at Chinese leaders, majority of them are trained or influenced along with Chinese intellectual community by the educational economic changes with the United States over the reform era. Yeah. This is great asset. But unfortunately, some people in Washington do not see that and they do not see in the same way. Yeah. Now, I think a real debate should take place, right? But on the other hand, it's true that uh, uh, the, the currently the Chinese will not, not see Russia is even the threat to China, right? Of course, there's some reservation maybe about the Russia for various reasons. Again, because the Chinese intellectuals are largely influenced by the West over the past 40 years. Not like the, the, the uh, earlier than that, the influenced by Russia, you know, this 1950s and through the educated elite. But uh, at least even the, the threat is the pronounced, you know, uh, objective to contain China, to, you know, um, treat China as the most prominent enemy. So that's explain the Chinese mindset the serious tensions between the two things I mentioned. So this is also uh, the answer to your excellent question, which you, you know, I agree, but I just want to provide the reasons why they got what they uh, believe now. But of course, this is subject to change. I mean, still it's a, uh, uh, the things could change, but uh, on the other hand, uh, the change needs to various parties, not just one side. Uh, thank you. I think, you know, I totally agree with you. If you perceive China as a threat, then what you get is a yeah. self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. Um, and then uh, a couple of my colleagues raised the two questions. One has a, lot, a little to do, has something to do with Ukraine. I think you've already um, made some observations. I wonder if you want to continue to talk a little bit about uh, 
how the situation in Ukraine relates to uh, U.S. China relations and, and uh, you know, what you've discussed. And then secondly, uh, there is a question about uh, the democratic process in China with uh, the, the new, um, uh, you know, upcoming leadership transition and, and this new cohort of leaders. Well, these are, um, both are excellent questions. Um, the current situation, so first of all, uh, sometimes foreign policy is driven by events. Uh, Ukraine situation is not over. I think uh, just like uh, all other issues, China is also becoming increasingly pluralistic, especially in Chinese society. And there's different views. Chinese intellectual community is very divided. And uh, uh, Chinese public uh, views also, um, on the one hand, you can see nationalism is on the rise uh, for the reason that I do not need to explain to this group. But at the same time, there's also, um, you know, uh, 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 critical views about uh, Russia's invasion. And also China for the past uh, four decades and uh, actually maintain the relationship with Ukraine. And, uh, um, you know, for example, that China's aircraft carrier and the first aircraft carrier Liaoning is yeah. actually remodeling of the, of the, you know, the, the aircraft carrier from Ukraine and China's aerospace in the aerospace industry. It's a, you know, significant part is from Ukraine, not from Russia. There are a lot of uh, serious exchanges going on, especially, you know, after denuclearization of Ukraine, there's a, a lot of agreement between China and Ukraine and the international community, right? So uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, the Chinese intellectual, many of them also inspired by liberal thinking, although they are critical about the, some of the hypocrisy of the West. But I mean, for this kind of things that uh, um, they, I, I would say that the public opinion, very pluralistic intellectual community uh, uh, is also pluralistic. It's difficult to understand the Chinese leadership view on that. It's very, very difficult. But uh, if you put your shoes in the Chinese leadership, it's a tough choice. It's a very tough position. And uh, again, I go back to my beginning. They want to see how events will unfold. Uh, there's some different perception, different views. And uh, China certainly uh, want to stay with so-called sovereignty and the United Nations and the common, plus, a common destiny. In that regard, they should probably condemn Russia. But at the same time, they're very suspicious about the US intention. Why now, after this, you wanted to uh, reconcile relation with China. But even that, it's not happening. And uh, particularly Republican, I mean, you see some delegations go to Taiwan. You see the rhetoric, even here last night, it's uh, the, the State Union, the commentary from, from, um, from the, the, the Republican. If Chinese believe that now, because you have some challenge with Russia, you want to have China, but you resolve that problem, you will focus on targeting China. So if that's the mindset, you, you can see uh, they will be hesitant to do that. So it is a complicated uh, issue uh, with a lot of dilemma. Uh, so uh, it's ultimately, it depends on how events will unfold. Uh, so this is uh, what can I cannot say. I do not want to make a simplistic generalization. Uh, the, you do see uh, China um, did not go along, uh, you know, in terms of gave a yes vote in the, in the United Nations uh, Security Council and uh, uh, absentee, but uh, that's actually, it's uh, quite interesting. But of course that, uh, that early on, the, we do not know whether the Chinese leader know, knew uh, when voting with China. No one knows, I, I do not know. I mean, um, um, probably very few people, even that probably it's very subtle. But the things is things change. And uh, so we do need to be a little bit cautious to not jump to the conclusion. But I think this event certainly show, uh, just like what happened 9-11, at least the immediate threat is not from China. And uh, 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 from terrorists, from uh, um, Al-Qaeda, and from now this time from Russia, right? Now, 
But I think that the United States in the mood still think China is the most important and you know you know enemy maybe. Uh, so if that's the case, so that also explains some Chinese hesitant. Now the other question is excellent. Or two, is about democratic process. This is democratic process. I should put it that way. This Chinese style, the intra-party mechanism. I will not put it in a way like the Western style of democracy. They will also certainly reject Western style of democracy themselves. But it's kind of a political experiments started by Deng Xiaoping. Now, let me also say that the, the, the China analysts, the Pekinologists, were very cynical about any real political reforms in China. But after Xi Jinping claimed the term limits, then people talk about how great the previous experiments were. But at that time, early on, only like uh, Michael Lampton, myself, many, some of the others said that, that these are important serious institutionalization, like, uh, like uh, you know, Alice Smith, like uh, um, Tony, Tony Satch, uh, uh, Michael Lampton, your teacher, right? I mean, uh, very, very few people argue that, that uh, we need to pay attention to the institutional development experiments, term limits, so-called collective leadership, but majority of China hands that disregard that, but only after term limits abolished, it was oh, how great the previous system. So I mean, that kind of cynicism makes people wonder. This is what I'm saying, I'm very, um, disappointed by the, the peakinology. We're supposed to improve, but uh, uh, that uh, really does not serve American interests. Uh, now, certainly Xi Jinping, uh, want, uh, and also the previous collective leadership, the internal check and balances, right? These regulations also have some side effects. Frag fragmentation, mm -hmm. right? The, the seven member of the Power Real Standing Committee or nine member of Standing Committee, they do they only control their own bureaucracy. There's also disobedience of the civilian leadership by the military. And there's also Bolshevik style, Western style campaign to for self-promotion. This could be also serious problem, not to mention about the corruption mm -hmm. and etc. So sometimes um, you know, uh, again. It's just what we put us in perspective, how one event lead to other. I'm a strong believer for democratic process. I'm a strong believer for check and balances. But the, the things is, should, should work in the context in China, should be very cautious about the cultural background to push for real change, lasting change. Not a proper change sometimes lead more chaos, right? So again, um, at the moment, certainly, um, the Western influence decline. Western yeah. democracy, um, it's not, uh, you know, it's so, you know, influential at the moment. And um, largely because of our own mistake, our own mean Western democracy, we experience our problem. But uh, having said that, I think that uh, uh, just like uh, my friend, uh, Recurping said democracy is a good thing. I still, still uh, believe, but it certainly should be Chinese style with Chinese characteristics. This is fair to say because democracy is different between, between even Western countries, among Western countries, etc. So how to prove that? Now, I think that uh, uh, some of the, the, I hope the election methods, some of the institutional norm the legal process and, um, and the transparency, these kind of things should not be through out of a window. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that if you do so, the backlash could be very, very strong mm -hmm. because China is a modern country. You do need to use some modern method, democratic method. So I think the important thing is to adapt to a new environment to make changes. Again, I do not want to so go to the Western style democracy, no. But I go to the China's own style check and balance or institutionalization. Now, people may give Xi Jinping a few more years to let him to sort out because it's a special time, it's a difficult time. Uh, but the, we, we cannot delay the process for too long. When is it too long? I think it's subject to environment, right? Uh, so that's my uh, answer to your, uh, your, your, your way. 
uh, your, your view. But I think that uh, uh, I think that the institutional mechanism uh, should be in, uh, included, and uh, should uh, I do, first of all, I do not see winner takes all will be really effective. And also, if they become you all own your people, there will be internal div div uh, uh, divides. Remember, Xi Jinping was a protege of Zhang Zemin, Zheng Qinghao. Yeah. Right. A princeling. But he moved away from princeling very, very effectively. So this is a constant dynamic. Um, I think this dynamic itself has its internal logic. Over. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, I know we are we are coming to the end of this uh, this uh, um, time block we reserved for this discussion. Um, I don't want to open another can of worms, but just very quickly, what are the implications of leadership transition for market reforms in China? Is it true that market reforms now carry a different meaning than before? In before, you know, market reforms mean, for example, liberalization, privatization you know, increasing congruence with international standards, et cetera. Now market reforms have a different meaning. It means, you know, based on what you decide, discussed a moment ago, means, you know, uh, role of state and, and uh, empowerment of uh, national champions, et cetera, et cetera. Is that, is that, is that reading uh, uh, correct or is it off balance? Well, there's some legitimate concern about uh, um, the emphasis on state-owned enterprises or over-emphasis on state-owned enterprises. There's some serious legitimate concern about uh, the, the small and the especially trivial uh, private firms have difficulties, the um, huge unemployment, partly because of COBRA, um, you know, uh, 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 partly because of the structure change. So uh, private firms have some difficulties. But let's also put in the perspective, it's not the Chinese leadership's intention or interest or whatsoever to want to, to uh, move away from private development. As Liu He said, five, six, seven, eight, nine, talk about the 50% of you know, GDP uh, growth, uh, you know, yeah. uh, 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 revenue, and also 90% yeah. of new jobs. So it's, it's their best interest to pri promote private sector. But uh, the, it, it, it is, um, are important that some of the monopoly by super uh, rich and also the danger of the property bubble by gigantic uh, property firm such as the Evergrande, it's, it's a debt, it's a huge. I mean, it's 2% of GDP, it's debt. Uh, that's a one single uh, property company. You do need to deal with that seriously. And also uh, just like the US, uh, has the serious concern about the te technical company's monopoly, right? Uh, so there's a legitimate uh, uh, need to control, but also there's some probably um, kind of, uh, 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 kind of uh, not explain too well, who give the wrong impression or send the wrong message, but that's subject to interpretation. And uh, so I think what is remarkable about China is they uh, find a great balance about uh, three or four sectors, uh, private sector, foreign joint, uh, uh, foreign investment, joint, you know, um, enterprises, and also the state-owned enterprises. Let's face it, that some of the other countries in China's neighboring countries, to a certain extent, the Western countries also have a, a important state sector as well. And, uh, the military industries complex, we, we call. So of course, I hope that there will be less on state of enterprises. Now, to a certain extent, you look at the IT company, the telecommunication, 15 years ago, dominated by the uh, 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 you know, telecom and, uh, and uh, all this name, I mean, it's a state of enterprise, uh, enterprises. But now look at IT industry. Most of the, these companies are privately owned, Alibaba, Tencent, TikTok, you know, Xiaomi, and et cetera. So that itself is a very, very dynamic. So I think it's found the best uh, balance. So I do not buy the argument that, that the China wants to throw out of private sector out of things. But uh, you are right, let's redefine the private sector with certain monetary. I think this is uh, the same thing with our founding father in the American, you know, federal papers all say too much government or too little government, both are not right. 
So we should find the, uh, 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 the right balance. So I, I hope, and already China's market uh, account for more than 50% of the GDP or, uh, or actually the more private firms. You can look at the rise of middle class and related to rise of the private sector, which did not exist before 1989. Yeah. Right. But now so powerful. And uh, also 20 years ago, very few private companies made it to the fortune, global fortune 500, but now there's so many, you know, uh, you know, of course the state owned prices also occupy, but the private sector, you see the development. So that's a remarkable development. I hope that uh, uh, China will adjust its economy in the right way, rather than uh, cause the social tensions. And it's not I think it's, a, it's right to completely crack down. And, uh, but at the same time, you know, uh, the excessive educational stocks or entertainment stock, I mean, you do need to adjust to make some adjustment, but at the same time, you should give the room or space for some of the, you know, uh, uh, legitimate uh, use or development. Okay, yeah. On that note, uh, uh, we'll wrap this up and thank you and, and really thank you for such a uh, stimulating and informative discussion. Uh, we certainly uh, hope that we can invite you back for another conversation. Uh, you've provided uh, us with a lot of food for thought, uh, you know. Um, we, we certainly uh, hope that China can sort out those problems because as I said, uh, whatever happens uh, to China actually carries a lot of implications for the rest of the world, for the United States as well. Thank, thank, you, thank you so much. much. It's my honor. Yeah. All right. Thank All right. You. Thank you, everyone, yeah. for, for participating in this discussion. And I hope you will come back and join in our uh, future series. I'll see you next time. Thank you very much again. Bye-bye. Bye, my friend. Bye. 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 Bye.